After painting miniatures for over 30 years, I recently realized I've pretty much never painted a bust. I painted, I think, one in this entire time, which was from Rackham. It was from their confrontation line. I can't remember what, what it's even called, but here's a picture. And I mean, that was probably, it was over a decade ago. And recently I've been feeling the urge to try painting a bust again for a number of reasons. I recently bought a really beautiful precast bust from Black Crow Miniatures. It's the Octavius Wizard. And he's still in the package because I am scared to screw him up. Paint bravely, they said. So recently a few things have pushed me over the edge to try out a bust. One was Jazza has been doing a series on his custom space screen chapter called the space bears and his enthusiasm has been infectious and you know kind of tipped me over the edge to purchase the digital file of the bust from puppet wars and print it myself and finally scott over at miniac recently painted a bust and in his uh, i think totally normal painting video it's the chef and just it turned out so beautifully and it inspired me to try painting a bust as well and as such i resolved i i, I tried to paint him as as good as I could. I wanted to look really, really nice as a display piece and the results are mixed. I know I keep saying that about everything I paint on the channel, but it's true. I didn't even use contrast paints for this. I think I used maybe one, but mostly I tried to uh, use normal hobby paints and just do traditional base coating and highlighting and things like that. Now, during this project, I found myself applying lessons I learned from a number of my fellow YouTuber hobbyists and I'll talk about those in a few minutes. Ultimately, I think he turned out pretty well, but it wasn't easy to do. And I would say after painting him up and spending a lot of time on him, that it was harder to paint a bus than it was a typical model, like a miniature or monster or vehicle where, you know, contrast paints, edge highlighting, all those things just tend to speed it up and just make it a little easier. So this won't be a step-by-step -step because it took me a long time to paint and there's a lot of steps. It just wouldn't really make for a great video to do every single step. But I'll talk about my thought process, some of the colors I used, some of the techniques I used as I approached painting this bust. Now I learned one thing real quick on this project and that is that preparation and how you actually print the miniature uh, matters to the final output. I printed them at 0.04 millimeters, thinking that would, you know, enhance the detail. And I spent a fair bit of time carefully removing the, the auto supports using hot water. I used a knife to remove um, some of the support marks after the fact and wear gloves because it's not cured yet. Then I cured it. I cleaned it very, very thoroughly. But there's still layer lines. And I, you know, looking back, I should have used anti-aliasing and I should have sanded it a little bit. But to the naked eye, I actually didn't notice the layer lines till I was well into painting. And the fact is to get a really nice result on a bust or a 3D print, you want minimal layer lines. You want a nice smooth surface. And I didn't have that in some ways on this guy. But it's not the end of the world and they're not actually that visible to the naked eye or when you're just looking at a normal distance they kind of blend in to be honest they mostly show up when you look closely i did paint this guy in two pieces i left the shield off so i could just paint it on its own and to have better access to the fur which i was going to likely end up using some dry brushing on now as we get to the meat and potatoes of painting this guy uh could you just boop the like button it would really help out the channel and uh you know, I promise you will probably like the rest of the video too, so it's worth committing. So I mentioned I was going to apply some lessons I learned from other YouTubers. Now with Marco from Not Just Mecca, I was thinking about a story for this guy, you know, that he would be cold. Uh, I was thinking about color theory, so blending, you know, uh, sorry, contrasting warm colors and cold colors, and also value and brightness. So I wanted the head area to be the brightest part of the model because that's the focal point of the model. But yeah, he's going to be cold. So I knew I was going to try and paint a cold face, which means reddish cheeks and nose and kind of a desaturated look to the skin. I actually found that hard to do, and you'll see in a bit. Um, because I couldn't figure out like how do you highlight and also make them red at the same time. I also knew I would not be putting snow or ice or frost on him because I knew I would F that up and I didn't want to wreck the model. True story. But here he is with some genuine Canadian snow. It's snowing for the first time this season uh, here in Canada. So I thought let's put him against a snowy backdrop and also a fence. But I talked about how I wanted the face to be the focal point and brighter. So that's why I primed the whole miniature black or the whole bust. And then I didn't do a zenithal. You don't always have to. I did, however, go back and prime white in, on the face and hair. I did learn from Miniac an idea about how to paint the eyes. 
or I in this case, and I did use a specular highlight. Eh, it turned out okay, not super duper. I could have done better on the eye. From Jazza himself, I kind of, well, I learned the basic color scheme of how he envisions the space bears, and I wanted to stay true to that, to be honest, and also this idea of tying in Native American touches to the designs and the color scheme. Sometimes it helps to just mentally plan out a project. For example, the parts that I knew I wanted to get right the most were the fur, the face, and the claws, which are all on the front. Less important, but still, you know, still important, the shield on the back, and then the lower torso, which is not really a focus, it's really up here. The part I was most worried about was the fur, because there is a lot of it. And really, it was going to make or break the impression of the piece because there was so much fur, and if, you, if I screwed it up, the whole thing wasn't going to look good. I wanted it to be grizzly fur, so I googled grizzly photos. It turns out grizzly fur tends to go from like anywhere from like a dark brown up to almost a beige in patches. And unlike some fur coats that are smooth and blended in a way, um, grizzly fur seems to be fairly, you can see the strands is what I'm trying to say, like it's striated. So that meant I was going to work my way up to almost like a beige ring or corona of the on the fur around sort of like framing the face and it also meant I could dry brush to pull out those strands and I did that. I used a makeup brush and just tried to pay attention while I was dry brushing to avoid any kind of streakiness that that dry brush can leave sometimes. I wanted to have reddish brown tones to the fur so starting with an overall base coat of Rhinox Hide I worked my, my way up through Mornfang Brown, Scrag Brown, then scrag with a little bone worked in, and then finally your shabti bone for the highest highlights. Not all over the fur, but in the areas where I wanted it to have that sort of beige patchiness that a grizzly has. To bring back some of the definition in the fur and kind of like pull all those layers together cohesively, I did another thing I learned from Marco, which is an oil wash. I used a reddish brown, I think it's burnt umber, and I diluted that with some odorless thinner, brushed it on and after a few minutes of letting it set a bit, I took a makeup sponge and I brushed it off in a way that would sort of restore some of the highlights and not like the entire area, but just some of them. And finally, when that was dry, I came back in with bone just to bring back the brightest highlights and make sure there was enough contrast in the fur. Now, if you recall, I said I wanted the hair and the face to have cold tones that would contrast with the surrounding dark, warm fur and the reddish armor, for example, on the shoulders. To do that, I started the hair with a dark blue. So the darkest parts of the hair are not dark gray, they're actually kind of a dark blue, in this case, Incubi Darkness. And then I worked the hair up through Dawnstone, Administratum Gray, all the way up to a titanium white ink highlight on the very tops of any of the curls of hair, strands of hair. I struggled with the skin. Kind of contradicting what I said about cold toned skin, I used uh, pro acryl shadow flesh as the base coat of the flesh of the skin on the face. I just got some pro acryl paints. They are really good, but the coverage was such that it didn't matter that I, I primed white because I just covered it up completely with the opacity of the shadow flesh. And shadow flesh is quite warm, so that didn't really make sense. But it was just to block it in and get a feel for the areas of the where you know where the flesh and skin met the hair. For the highlight layers to cool down the tone of the skin, I used a flesh tone. I forget which one exactly, but I mixed in gray. So I think this would have been like a space wolf gray or Fenrisian gray, a cool gray. I mixed that in roughly almost like 50-50. And then I added glaze medium and I started glazing that onto the face. I then worked up highlights by adding pallid witch flesh, which again is a very cold color. Although, and, and yeah, I wanted his skin to be pretty pale because cold skin where it's not red can be kind of pale. But I wasn't allowing my layers enough time to dry. I was rushing and my pallid witch flesh was kind of coagulated and it was chunky. And I think it was get, I was getting like probably micro chunks in my mix and in the end because of those things his face ended up kind of chalky and lumpy and that's a disaster for a bust and you know i look at scott's chef which with its beautiful creamy smooth face and blends and i was i was really disappointed in how this face was turning out so what i ended up doing is taking a little bit of isopropyl alcohol isopropyl alcohol on a small brush a soft brush too and just lightly painting over the face with that alcohol to try and get the paint to reactivate a little bit and smooth out. And it kind of worked. 
actually. It didn't strip and it just kind of helped enough. Like it's still not great, but it helped. After painting the face, you know, just basically the same technique as I described before, just trying more carefully to get a smooth coat. I then, to get that reddishness on the nose and the cheeks, I glazed in um, some blood letter glaze, but I added even more glaze medium to try and build it up real slowly. I think his nose might be a little too red, but maybe he had some beers before he went out to fight. I mentioned that Native American motif that, or, you know, design stylings that Jazza has said are part of the Space Bears. I tried to work in some of those colors. I even Googled it and I think I found essentially the same colors he did. I used a website to try and create a color palette that would be complementary. And in the end, I ended up adding some yellow and some of this teal color to certain aspects, not all over the place. In fact, I painted them on the shoulders and then covered them up later with gold because it didn't look quite right. But on the shield in particular, I, I, I used those colors. Now, speaking of the gold and the trim, I used an appropriately named Scale 75 metallic called Viking Gold. I think it looks really good. It's kind of like just the right kind of gold. And to highlight that, I just added little bits of their alchemy. I think it would have been peridot and or white alchemy to brighten it up without changing the tone too much. Now with the claws, I wanted them to stand out as well. Recall it's like the face, the fur, and the claws are where I'm trying to put the most emphasis in. I used like a gunmetal on the, on the claws and then to brighten them up, I went all the way up highlighting to Vallejo Metals Silver, which is very, very bright. It's almost chrome in, in tone. And I used those just on the curving parts of, use that just on the curving parts of the claws so that they'd look really bright as you looked at the bust. Across the model, I mixed up different kinds of metallics to create some variation. He has a lot of metal areas to be, to be honest, like especially on the shield. I use like Rune Lord brass. I use Canoptic alloy and bronze colors. So like the, the claw thing on the shield that's like a like a bronze color that's been highlighted up a little bit. The one section I struggled with the most was that central sort of smooth featureless ring on the shield. Like the shield is really pretty ornate for a shield, I think. So I painted it metallic and because it's vertical, I just was struggling to make it look right to have any visual interest and not look flat and plain, which it kind of does. And it also ended up looking a little patchy. So that was the part I had the most trouble with. One of the final touches I did is I glazed in a little bit of blue black, um, which is similar to how I did the black armor uh, when I highlighted it, a little blue black from Proacryl, um, because I've seen better painters do that using, uh, you know, complementary colors to create the shading and shadows of another color. So in this case for red, I was shading it with a bluish black. I think it looks pretty good. Now in the end, I did not varnish this piece. Varnishing as much as you think of it as protecting a miniature, which, you know, these days, plastic miniatures, it's debatable how much you need to do that, but it changes the finish of a model quite a bit sometimes, and especially metallics. It can really dull them down if you use a matte varnish there. But I, I kind of wanted the unifying finish of a varnish, and instead I used Lamian Medium through my airbrush. And the good thing about using it through the airbrush, another plug for airbrushing, is that I could keep away from the metals a little bit. So I was able to apply it to the face and the fur, which had had that oil wash, right? Anywhere that I wanted to kind of, and even down here on some of the metals, I was okay with that. I used that to unify the finish in a number of spots while keeping some of the shine on the shoulder pad trim and things like that. In the end, this was a fun project, partly because it's a cool bust and it was fun to paint, and partly because it wasn't a standard miniature monster or vehicle, which is the bulk of what I paint and have been painting for this many many years. Busts are just for display really and it can be hard to pull yourself away to paint one because usually a lot of us I think are painting for D&D, we're painting for armies, we're painting for one of those two things, tabletop gaming, like we're painting to use these miniatures in our gaming quite often and so painting a bust kind of feels like you could be spending that time on a piece you're going to use instead of just put on a shelf. So hopefully this project of mine was interesting to follow along and see how I approached it. And maybe it's inspired you to try painting a bust. Doesn't have to be this bust, could be any bust, maybe the chef that Miniac painted. Or maybe it was just relaxing to watch how I approached painting up this miniature. I think it probably could be pretty chill. If it was, maybe subscribe and I'll have more of those kind of videos for you. If you're interested in watching how I approach trying some other new things, I have this video where I try the grimdark style you might find interesting if you haven't seen it already. But until then, happy painting and we'll see you next time.